Yeah, that's great. So I got my controls back. Sorry about that. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and and do this all at the same time. So uh, give me a shout if I'm going too fast or if you can't see something. Uh, please let me know. Yeah. Um, try and speed this up. But what yeah. I want to do is I, I just want to start with sort of uh, painting a picture of some of the legacy application issues and nuances that we have around desktops and applications uh, alike. So uh, entertain me for a couple of slides. Uh, let, let me paint the picture. So uh, the issue we face with uh, most of our, 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 our um, considering application desktop design, right, hasn't changed much over the last decade. So uh, the first step in achieving a modern desktop is to decouple the OS and the application settings, obviously, from physical devices. Uh, and the next step is to decouple each of these components from each other so they can be managed separately from each other. And that's called the, the modern desktop. You know, that hasn't changed for a while. So these components is then moved into a data center uh, where we can uh, better manage them. We can patch them, update them, refresh the OS without having to impact the end users uh, customization or the personalized desktop. A desktop can then be delivered from that data center to the end user across locations and devices. And we all agree, I think, you know, uh, this is still relevant today and we still aim to achieve, uh, even though this slide is more than 10 years old, um, you know, it, it hasn't changed how we deliver that desktop and what we aim to uh, abstract from the, the physical workstation, right? So the just-in-time management platform was then introduced to include the latest technologies to further enhance that modern desktop. Uh, with JMP, uh, this changes our delivery model and it works across infrastructure platforms, enabling us to deliver the applications in real time and apply a contextual policy management uh, on top of a, an automated provisioning process. So there's, a, there's a, a number of legacy components with modern alternatives. Uh, and it's important to keep this slide in mind as we talk through the new hybrid uh, and cloud approach. The session is not uh, about what we had in Horizon 7 or, you know, uh, but it's good to understand the current ability within the application desktops and the settings layer. You, you can quickly see uh, from where we started this conversation more than 10 years ago, to now, this has become slightly more complex, I'd say. So whether you plan to stay on Horizon 7 or upgrade to Horizon 8, uh, these modern alternatives can improve performance for you, agility and, and your user experience, while still catering for that legacy and modern application. So for the remainder of the session, I'll be looking at the multi-cloud with a particular focus on the Horizon Cloud on Azure and talk about some of the hybrid use cases here. So, We've just seen in order to deliver a consistent user uh, capability within the application layer and the desktop, the approach and tooling from a, a VDI and an application on premises should match whatever we deliver in the cloud. Uh, this is not always possible. Uh, we still need to accommodate legacy apps and, and desktop publishing frameworks. So a, a rip and replace will not always work for everybody. We will need to look at adapting our culture of traditional delivery models to one that embraces that change. Uh, the, the, the changes is mostly for administrators, but the same changing model also introduces constant uh, or consistency for the end user's experience across those platforms and devices. So if, if we look at this, the example in, in the delivery model here is the same, but for our cloud portion of a user profile, we augment uh, using tools uh, used in a, uh, in, a, in a container from FS Logics to create the same and consistent experience for the user when we move between that on-prem and cloud desktop, if we say, for instance, deliver app volumes. So just building the slide out, you can see in the first one, you know, that's the vSphere. Sorry, I've got user presenter in my way. Um, you've got that uh, vSphere uh, on-prem on the left-hand side, and then on the right-hand side with a, with a dem and, and writable volume. And then as we move to the cloud, uh, we change that strategy slightly to dem and FS logics. So Again, the abstraction layers hasn't changed, uh, but we are cognizant of how we deliver applications and users and profiles as we write through uh, from on-prem to Horizon Cloud on Azure, right? So it's important to understand Horizon Cloud on Azure offers your digital transformation we require on-prem uh, and across cloud deployments. And yeah, I, I had a lot of uh, comments about this slide, but you know, I suppose you can choose, you know, who, who led your digital transformation. Uh, but like I say, you know, 
sometimes it's a bit like the um, tail wagging the dog. And I, and I think, yeah, um, it's, it's important for us to understand we, we all face the same challenges around enabling that remote workforce with the capability and scale issues that businesses tell us to curb our IT spend, deliver bigger, better systems in an ever-changing security challenge environment. And I'm sure everybody will agree that this is not always achievable. Uh, without the correct tooling, um, you know, it, it's just not possible. So let's have a look at what contributes towards that effective design of the actual app and desktop in the <coughs> cloud, right? So looking at the potential savings, our customers find it vital to obviously understand how this will reflect within their deployments. We as techers get asked more and more to provide evidence that these changes uh, you know, to the current application or the platform needs to be measurable. And I'm not going to do a session on, on TCO or RI, but I want to point out some key elements to remember as you design your transformational Horizon Cloud on Azure journey. Um, we really need to keep this in mind, right? So our internal analysis show that within an infrastructure shift, we can measure up to a 70% saving. Uh, licensing, a further and up to 60% saving. And then finally, total cost of ownership, uh, another 60% saving. Again, you know, keep the slide in the back of your mind and, and we'll bring it all together in a minute so you can see how maybe cost versus your design versus your application will impact your decision going forward. And I mean, that's all great, right? But, but how do we actually achieve these savings? And, and this is now where, where we need to start making some choices. So we start by understanding the partnership, I think, between Microsoft and VMware. Um, this is designed to obviously help our customers accelerate their cloud adoption uh, while maximizing on cost saving and delivering an exceptional user experience. But this will also benefit you in understanding why the Horizon Cloud Control Plane and services are vital to your success. Uh, with the, uh, the combination of these platforms, our customers can then begin using their WVD benefits quicker by taking advantage of this hybrid support and a common management interface across all of those platforms. Uh, and this is exactly what we're gonna focus on next, right? So the combination of Windows Virtual Desktop and Horizon Cloud on Microsoft Azure can help customers achieve that desktop virtualization and remote work goals. Uh, while driving costs down. And I don't think anybody um, disputes that. Uh, but the, in the first step, WVD gets you started, right? So you have the licensing and it's already included in your Microsoft EA. And this entitles you to use that Windows 10 Enterprise multi-session and includes the discounted Azure pricing. So from that point, Horizon Cloud on Microsoft Azure adds significant value that you can drive down the operational cost of running a desktop virtualization environment in the cloud. I'll be clinging through this uh, column, not to uh, dismiss it, but to focus on today's session where we're going to talk about the capability of how the technology underpins the statement uh, rather than each statement uh, on its own. So there we can just see the extra four columns, uh, removes the need for third party hybrid architecture, management and cost optimization, and then the enhanced user experience. So looking at that, putting that all together, if we do go to a cloud strategy, one of the first things we need to look at is, um, I suppose, the first economic benefit for the infrastructure. Uh, it, you can have a Windows 10 uh, experience at a multi-session cost. It matters to you, uh, I think, because you know, with today's VDI solutions, you'll have to either go with Windows Server RDS, which compromises on a user experience, or Windows 10 single session, which compromises you on cost. Uh, but, you know, with a WVD model, you can get both. Uh, so let's take a look at the customer migration scenario. If you're using a Windows 10 single session on-prem today for better user experience, uh, then <coughs> WVD is the best solution here for you going forward because it not only provides you that local like a Windows 10 experience for your end user, but it also saves you obviously big bucks on multi-session deployments. So, uh, and let me explain why. For a single uh, session deployment here on the left, you can see you'll need one small uh, VM per user, which usually ends up uh, a low utilization. Uh, in, in comparison for a multi-session deployment in the middle plane, you can have a larger shared VM, um, and that's to support multi-users so that they have a higher utilization. And in addition to that, since you'll have fewer VMs, uh, you can also expect to have a, a lower <coughs> operational cost, right? 
as seen on the right hand side here. So the key difference of WVD is you, you'll find no other solution in the marketplace that can support obviously the Windows 10 multi-user session. So this is, again, this is a very unique use case. Um, and again, you know, this is not, this is not totally about cost, but we do keep these models uh, in mind because yes, our application or our user desktop has to sit on something and how we transition from on-prem to a multi-cloud or into a cloud, uh, for instance, in Azure, uh, makes an impact as to the OS that we ultimately land on. So I'll take one more quick example and just show you. Uh, and in this example, you can quickly see from on-prem, we change from an RDS Cal licensing model where we can then remove the need for having that license entitlement uh, and move and migrate that to Windows 10 WVD multi-session. So <clears> that <throat> multi-session there doesn't require the extra CAL. So the saving here comes from the CAL not needed. So I, I think, you know, both of the, um, I, I've just used two use cases and two quick examples. We, we shouldn't confuse these with what we technically need to design, right? Um, there is a saving to be made when you move between license types or machine types, uh, a single session versus multi-session, uh, but there is still a trade-off as to how do we manage the actual desktop and the application that we need to host on there, and what is the financial impact to that versus the cost of, say, a hybrid mode or how we manage those applications on-prem today. It's very easy to buy infrastructure as a service. Uh, we all know that, right? And we see lines of business using their corporate credit cards to buying pads, and the same goes for software as a service. But when it comes to the desktop as a service, things become a bit more complicated. Uh, and now we look at outsourcing, insourcing models, uh, including challenges around security, ownership, and responsibility for the multiple platforms and applications that is dependent on those on those desktops, right? So. The desktop as a service is exactly what we aim to achieve here, but not by purchasing a desktop or outsourcing. No, we, we need to achieve this by enabling you to deliver this as a, a desktop as a service, right? So customers can achieve this then through a single license that entitles you to that VMware Horizon feature uh, to maintain both that legacy and new world, but creating desktop as a service. And it, you know, again, just talking through this very quickly, um, and, I'm, and I'm aware not everybody has seen uh, the capabilities maybe before. Um, so we, we can dive into them maybe a bit later, but if we go left to right, the universal brokering, uh, anybody who hasn't seen that, uh, that is, is, is there to replace something like GSLB. With universal brokering, we can do a multi-pod or multi-cloud assignment without the need for CPA and without the need for GSLB the universal broker can then uh, broker those sessions to our applications and desktops, regardless of the desktop uh, or the application necessarily being tied from one pod or from one data center to another. We can then, uh, using that universal broker strategy, we can then use that universal control plane and do our image management. So the same thing, any pod that we are connected to and we create that golden or master image, we can then replicate that image into any pod that we touch or that we extend into. And I'm hoping to demo this very quickly at the end for you as well, so you can see how that works. Um, and then the application management, which is the most important part, right? So now we can get from anywhere to the application, we can uh, manage that golden image, uh, if I can call it that. And, and the application management sitting on top of that uh, can now be consistently packaged um, into these layers, you know, through different means, either through hosting, uh, streaming, uh, app volumes, et cetera. And we're gonna look at that in a minute as well. Uh, we do need to monitor, not, not just the application and desktop, but we also need to extend that monitoring to our hybrid scenario where some of these applications might still live on-prem, right? Um, and then lastly, you know, how do we keep all of this in sync? So we need to have a good overview of that lifecycle management and be able to now have that overarching view where we can keep all of this in step lock and sync as we maintain our patching, our OS and, and levels going forward, right? So because Horizon Cloud on Azure is a native cloud service, uh, there's clear lines drawn uh, for management responsibilities. The customer provides the Azure tenant, right? The AD, the OS licenses and the images and apps. They're very simple. The, the um, 
uh, sorry, VMware manages the desktop, uh, the virtualization infrastructure uh, while providing you su uh, support. Right? And then Microsoft at the last layer here provides the infrastructure. So as you can see, the service as Horizon Cloud on Azure is clearly defined, uh, not just for support, but also you'll see our documentation clearly defining this as a DAS platform software. And that's for that exact reason. And I think this is maybe why I've spent a bit of time going slightly around the houses to explain that, you know, that layer of abstraction for our settings, our users and applications, you know, is really there to create this model where VMware will support you through a single control plane to continue managing that as you do on-prem today, but into the cloud, um, with the only difference is obviously not having to worry about this lower uh, layer, the infrastructure layer, or the actual uh, management components of that. And if you keep the green icons uh, just in mind, I'll show you in a second how these uh, green lines um, fit into the management model, right? And this is really where the rubber now meets the, the road. This is the bold. Uh, it's important to, to understand the mechanics and the partnership and, and how we refer to these services. So uh, the best way to think of Windows Virtual Desktop is a collection of Azure resources dedicated to remote Windows desktops. So on top of that, uh, Microsoft builds a set of features that customers with certain license types are entitled to. And those uh, feature types include support for uh, Windows 10, Windows 10 multi-session, uh, Windows 7 with uh, ESU until uh, January 2023, I think, and then uh, Windows Server RDSH workloads, uh, Windows 10 Enterprise, and uh, obviously Windows 7 with free ESU uh, are obviously uh, exclusive features of that service, right? So, um, as you can see, that is the WVD service, right? VMware also has a desktop virtualization platform built on Azure. It's called Horizon Cloud on Microsoft Azure. This has been around for several years, so it shouldn't be confused with building on top of an existing WVD integration through the native portal in Azure where you see a little WVD tab. Um, it's, it's important to distinguish that, you know, it's a service entitlement. So our partnership with Microsoft allows us to run these features of Windows Virtual Desktop through our own control plane uh, on Horizon uh, Cloud on Azure. So you'll, you would have likely heard that Horizon Cloud on Azure or the Horizon control plane can run other platforms too. Uh, but it's only on this platform that you will be entitled to run the Windows 7 ESU and the Windows 10 multi-user uh, sessions. Um, WVD, uh, you know, obviously includes uh, features as part of the service, which you know, we, we're not going to dive into, but the native service, if you go into your portal or into Azure, you can switch these on and make use of them. Now, they are not built out. You still need to build these out. Uh, but again, the entitlement and the service is there if you have the right license entitlement. Verizon Cloud on Microsoft Azure introduces that modern desktop framework. So we've been talking about introducing these features instead of uh, just the base features, right? So, uh, and, then, and if we look at uh, FS Logix, uh, it's left in place because it's available across all your enterprise Windows desktops and it works in conjunction with uh, VMware DEM. So ultimately you now have a platform through the Horizon Cloud on Azure service that enables you to offer uh, desktop as a service. So again, I, you know, I don't think we have uh, exactly the time to talk through each one of these. Um, you know, some of them is services, some of them is complete uh, software packages that, that enhances the service. Uh, but if, if you think about what the control plane has been uh, designed to do and how desktop as a service is now enabling you with storage compute network database and security at the Azure layer, to expand the way you think of a desktop and application. Um, I think in the next slide, what I've done is I've just made it possible for you to see that what you could possibly do uh, into relation with your workload if you were to use that, right? So if you look at my example, uh, within days or hours, you can create an entire pod in say US East regional data center and in that pod, uh, we could say, for instance, have an isolated pool for a 30-day project. So 
So I can spin that up. I can still make use of all my on-prem uh, resources. And again, you know, not to be confused, you know, I can VPN them in. I, I don't need a dedicated line necessarily in or express route so, uh, set up. You know, I can do that over a normal VPN or I can build it all out in Azure. Uh, but safe to say that I can spin up a pod within hours uh, deliver a short-term project, let's say for a day or for 30 days. Uh, and at the same time, I can have a production pod uh, in say US East 2, where this is role-based access for uh, US employees or, or contractors that needs to work on a service contract, right? Um, although I might be a UK-based company. So as you can see, you can spin the resources up, uh, you can allocate them, you can use that con complete control plane with image management to design these data centers uh, and still conform to the security that you have on-prem, but without the commitment to the infrastructure. So you can scale up or scale down uh, without having to build out an, an entire footprint that you commit to forward. Uh, it, when we do this on-prem, you know, it's needless to say, uh, you know, we, we need to commit to the hardware, we need to spec the hardware, uh, we need to build out on it, and you know, there's a big uh, decom process after that. Can we ever reuse it? Can we sweat the assets for four to five years? And then in this example, what we're saying is, well, one of your use cases might be that you have enough on-prem, you might wanna expand or you wanna use the footprint for DR. You wanna use it for a specific use case where you wanna create desktop and application isolation. Um, and you know, and these are some of our legacy constraints, right? You know, isolation within legacy environments on-prem is sometimes very difficult for us to start ring fencing this and suddenly create brand new isolation and micro segmentation um, frameworks um, is very difficult. But we can achieve that within hours or days if we look at that strategy of using the control plane in Azure. So again, just a couple of universal uh, license benefits. Remember, all, all customers with a universal license are entitled to the Horizon Cloud on Azure. So from the picture I've just quickly drawn, um, remembering those little green icons, as you can see, the Horizon Cloud Control Plane that is built uh, by VMware sitting on Microsoft Azure um, is responsible for creating that jump box that will ultimately be the automation engine behind uh, deploying and creating that first step to your uh, pod or your deployment within Azure. And then from there, you know, um, it, it will then set up the management node and the management node will still be in contact with the control plane to receive all those services on top of it. But from a customer point of view, you know, you bring your infrastructure as a service uh, to the party or your on-premise uh, environment. Uh, and then from there, you know, the control plane itself uh, can then either manage uh, the on-premise or the images and the applications as you build them out here in Azure. And as you can see, you know, these are native services to, to the WVD environment, if we can call it that, within Azure. Um, and, and this light blue is really where we concentrate on. So understanding what we are capable of um, at a very, very uh, fast pace and very high level overview, uh, it's, it's amazing to think what you can achieve once you understand that benefit of what the horizon uh, control plane can offer for you. And, and I think it's, you know, I, I wanted to share this with you guys. Um, uh, you know, it's amazing to see uh, a large insurance firm on the, on the left hand side that's delivered 35,000 uh, virtual desktops within five days. Um, you know, and yes, you know, it must be said out there that was a greenfield deployment. Uh, but at that same time, you know, if we go to the other end of the scale, you know, we've had a university, you know, with current workloads, uh, and, and they've integrated what they have on prem, expanding that to uh, Azure, uh, and, and that was done within a week for 2000 uh, GPU workloads. Anybody who's worked with those will understand that, you know, just the tweaking and getting that stuff set up correctly, most probably take you a week. So, you know, that was pretty amazing to see how quickly uh, people can transform. And, and that's why I like to use the word transformation for this. If you think about the application desktop constraints, right? It's not always a hard, uh, how can I say, edge or cliff drop uh, for, for the decision here, right? It, it is a transformation. So if you think about how you manage things today, the way you want to take it forward, um, that might be a strategy of uh, a, a new world uh, living side by side with what you have today. 
And again, you know, VMware is here to obviously help you modernize that. So there is a huge amount of tutorials and parts and options that we can share with you. Um, and I have a lot of that. I will share that afterwards in the slide and deck. Uh, but you know, the base, the the, the best uh, place to go and look for these is TechZone, and it's really your 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 first place you should start to look at that. And we started writing out how to do some of these transformation models, um, how to modernize your BDI, and started writing some tutorials. But it is important to understand that you know not all strategies will have the same starting point or the same journey for that matter. And we need to only agree on the transformation that the business needs to adopt in order to create this framework, right? So feel free to reach out to me or, you know, if you, if you have a local SE that you're in, in touch with or sort of at VMware to help you um, or, or guide one, on, on one of these topics or sessions. And, and we'll be happy to help or, or share the different parts that you can take in order to uh, build your strategy out. So. Um, there's a couple of resources that you that's free to you or, or a customer alike, um, and you can use the VMware Go uh, HCA Azure trial, right? Uh, that's a 90 day free trial that you can go and sign up. Um, and if you want to obviously create an environment a bit longer than that, uh, get in touch with me and we can help you with some POC environments. If you don't want to build any of this and you just want to see how it works uh, together, I know today we're only focusing on uh, an application or a desktop towards the Horizon Cloud on Azure, uh, but you can go and see the Azure and the AWS uh, all built out in test drive. So give that a go as well and um, you know see if, if, if that works for you. So, I think uh, just looking at the time, um, let's see if I can get this uh, screen up and then I can show you a quick live demo of what we have in that portal. Everybody still awake? We're going with the um, spirit is willing. We'll see. <laughs> we're, we're praying to the demo gods right yeah, now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm more praying to the uh, you know to the Zoom God today. I can't <laughs> exactly, to... okay. done something wrong. It it seems to be that I'm only allowed to share an application right now. So let's see if that is allowing me. Sorry, let me give me one sec. Okay, that's good. Oh, look at that positive face. <laughs> <laughs> cool, the, the, the positive uh, face has now taken my um, mouse and turned that into, I don't know, something <laughs> that's not there. <laughs> okay, there we go. So, there we go. Please tell me you can see oh, this. Oh man, it's working. <laughs> Is that working? Yep. Yep. Can we see this? Oh, good. Good stuff. Okay, so how much time do we have left? Just a quick time check. Uh, we've got roughly about 10 minutes, right? Okay, so I will take this at pace. You tell me to slow down or speed up. Um, for anybody who has not never seen this dashboard, this is Horizon Cloud and is your dashboard, you know, fancy monitoring and all that. But the first time you'll ever see this dashboard is when you get started. Um, and, and just quickly to point out, when you get uh, the first time onto Microsoft is your uh, control plane, you get this beautiful getting started screen. Everything is grayed out on the left. And what this helps you with is it helps you to build out your entire environment step by step. So I don't want to say we have other technologies like this. I'm not going to refer to things like VCF or anything else, but this is a bit more prescriptive. So we're making sure that if you are doing this as a POC, if you're doing this as a pilot, if you're doing this for your customer, if you're doing this as production, as long as you follow these steps, you're going to pretty much end up in a very good place. I don't want to say best practice because there's a couple of places you can obviously break the rules. Uh, you don't necessarily need to switch on HA for things, uh, but you know this will quickly help you through building each one of those out. And these will only open and let you install and connect uh, each component as you fulfill the, the prerequisites, right? So for instance, uh, unless you go and add a My VMware account, uh, you know, it won't even allow you to set up Active Directory. Once you have the Active Directory and it's checked the bind and join account, you know, then only will it allow you to do roles and permissions. 
then only will it uh, allow you to do your uh, broker for that universal setup. And then from there, will it start opening the menus and say, right, now you can start importing a VM, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And it walks you through each part. So you can see if you've missed something uh, or, or if you still need to do something. And then once you've finished, you can switch off that landing page, you know, and, and, and you're happy to go to your capacity and do everything through the left menu here. Yeah. So, Diving into this very quickly, you can see, and this is only a POC or lab environment, uh, but I've got three pods. So again, you know, here's where we talk about that agility of what I can do with the desktop and the application. I have a pod in London, Slough and Paris, and I have a hybrid pod in Slough, right? So you can see from, from the onset, you know, I have a connector, which is a hybrid environment that says private data center there. Uh, so that is all my legacy stuff on-prem. And when I say legacy, I don't mean legacy as in it's old. I just mean that, you know, that is where some of my older applications might be residing right now. That's not, say, SAML aware, right? And then some of my newest stuff is maybe in these pods. Uh, so the challenge is, you know, I can go into these pods and again, you know, creating that single uh, pane of glass, we can then look at from this dash dashboard, we already can see how cloud monitoring services works differently. So I know we have that mindset of VR ops and how we used to use V4H, but if you start thinking about the slightly different, uh, the way we want to look at things at a glance, and then what we run a report on, uh, you'll maybe start uh, making a bit more sense for you as to how we're doing things uh, with what we call CMS and then maybe the new MP4H packs that, that's uh, released as a, as a cloud only uh, solution, right? Um, and here you can quickly see an overview of, am I healthy on-prem? You know, I haven't logged into on-prem, you know, I'm still on the cloud UK, my control plane, uh, and at a glance, I can see everything that I need to see to make sure it's in, in good working order. And from here, you know, I have that single sign-on uh, that is, you know, integrated once I've integrated all my components. So I can flash up, for instance, the Horizon um, uh, console itself. And as you can see, it'll go through, um, it's still within the Cloud UK uh, URL. It'll hide everything else for me. It'll pass my credentials over and it'll give me my full dashboard. So, you know, I had no need to log in or expose this dashboard or get into an RDSH server. I can manage any on-prem environment that is part of my capacity, right? And in here, I can now go and see, you know, desktops, everything else, right? I mean, you guys have seen these dashboards many, many times. So switching back to the cloud pod, um, as you can see, very easy to connect either uh, your capacity for on-prem or in the cloud. And when we wanna create a new pod, again, it's as simple as, you know, create one, you know, select your subscription, you know, select the, the, the region that subscription is in, um, you know, if it's an existing or a new site, uh, you know, again, you know, choose the pod location. And as you can see, I've got about four steps I need to fill in uh, to create a brand new uh, environment. Once I have that environment, my environment then comes prepackaged uh, with uh, not just the connections to that pod, uh, but also the file and uh, application storage layers, right? So as you can see here, I have a staging and delivery. And what we can now do is remember, we said we want to keep sync with how we work on images, uh, applications, uh, for instance, app volumes and things like that. Um, so this is where it gives us the visibility to go play in the background and sync some of these objects up. And I'll show you that in, in, in one second. Uh, we can also then look through and see system activity, uh, user activity, when, when things was powered up, when it was powered down, uh, audit logs. So as you can see, you know, this works a bit different to, we would typically have maybe systems that would give us reports. Um, here, we would rather wanna click through on things and uh, drive it straight from here. And from here, we'd like to export the logs directly or filter for those um, specific issues we have on these pods to troubleshoot them in real time. Um, and, and, you know, we can also change things like uh, certificates. You know, this is not a big pain. You know, we, we can quickly change the certificates, uh, download the logs for the entire pod, or, or, or generally just update this uh, pod to, to what we need to, to perform the function for us in Azure. And if we think we add a limit for the subscription for that region, remember this has got nothing to do with 
uh, the EA you've signed or, or how many you're entitled to. It just means that that region, that pod you're in, you know, uh, I've used so many of those CPUs. So open a help desk tickets that is automated with, uh, with the Microsoft team and you can put a workflow through that will automatically just up my amount of processes I have there for that DB3 family, right? Or I change the delivery model, simple. So now we understand what the capacity looks like um, and it matches up a bit uh, with, the, with the slide. So you can see how easy it is to create this capacity. Um, we can now go and say, right, you know, for all these sites and resources we have, let's look at the applications. So firstly, you know, we've imported an, an image from say the marketplace and then the image would go to uh, sort of a holding pen. This holding pen, we will then publish that image through. And when, when we publish the image through, we can then utilize that image wherever we want in any pod. And, you know, the same goes for uh, our on-prem. So I've left it in two states on-prem, right? So I've just created a 1909 one here. So I've imported a, a simple image uh, on on-prem and I you know this management name gets automatically assigned to it by the control plane so once I've imported it and I've now said you know this is one of my golden images that I'm going to use and I want everybody in the world to use this golden image I can then go and publish it so then when I publish it it'll look like this on the next stage right so we publish it it then becomes available to everybody to use and then it changes into a pool where we can then say, you know, there is a uh, instant clone uh, behind that pool. And we can now utilize that copy wherever we want. So we can sync that copy up for all admins uh, to use exactly the same um, golden image, right? So what that, what that would look like, I hope I didn't close the screen. No, I didn't. So the, the immediate thing you'll see is if you look at how a normal image is presented within vCenter or in vSphere itself, you can see the source is vCenter or it says that, you know, it's a remote desktop service because it's built from say a, a pool, right? Uh, but in this case, the moment we attach it from the cloud, you will see it says image catalog. And that's because it uses that power of your, your vSphere catalog um, uh, replication services to then make sure that the same image can be used to deploy different uh, pools or for, for different uh, pods um, around the world, right? And, and again, we didn't use necessarily any CPA or anything like that. So there's no cloud pod, pod architecture or anything else switched on to achieve that. So it is merely a way of making sure that we can replicate between all private data centers that we are connected into the same image. And then from that image, we can then go and assign those images um, through a simple tab where we assign it, right? I'm very conscious of time. So if you'd allow me two more minutes. Um, the reason why I started with RDS versus a multi-user session versus say just an application on-prem is uh, when you start building these out, one of the things you'll quickly realize is once you have the power of the universal broker, when I go and assign, um, say for instance, a desktop in Azure, right? And I wanna assign a desktop as floating. I can, I can assign a desktop to any site, to the nearest site, or I can pin it. I can restrict it to a single site. And this becomes very powerful. This is the part that we've been driving towards, right? And this is the admin overhead. So we can now for the first time have a single pane of glass where all the work that we've put in uh, we can assign it now through a single uh, screen and we can say you know select all of these pods you know i want to you know any site um, and my user obviously connect to the nearest site to them uh, and i'm going to create a desktop model now um, that has the same operating system for everybody and as you can see from each pod it'll go and pull an image and it'll make sure that that image is in keep with what we need to distribute so everybody has the same desktop and then from there you know i confirm i've I've got a license for that. Uh, uh, and then we can start now setting up each pod for each region. So although it's a single assignment, I can then go into each of these pods. I can add power management to that. I can say, you know, uh, minimum desktops, uh, you know, for say today or for each day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, uh, needs to be one. Uh, I can put the starting time in. And again, you know, I can manipulate and say, you know, for this, for this pod is obviously London. So for that time zone, 
it needs to be available between those uh, times, right? Uh, but at the same time, let's say, for instance, for my Paris pod, I can then say, you know, within the same pool, uh, you know, please add a schedule here. Uh, but this time, we're going to say, right, you know, make sure that that is in keeping with local time for them. So when we say there's a seven o'clock, say, start for, for that uh, user, um, then we make sure that that user has an available desktop between those hours uh, in that time zone. Once that's all assigned, as you can see now, the biggest saving comes from it will switch off all of these resources outside of those times. Uh, but it will also follow the sun for each pod that I've allowed that desktop to be deployed in. As you can see, my desktop or, or my headquarters is still stains, uh, but you know I, I provide my users with the same image across the world. I can then obviously go a step further and you know assign it, etc. But I can then also assign the ad volumes to the same amount of users around the world. So anywhere that we have, uh, let's say for instance, we have a critical application called Notepad. Um, I can then say you know Notepad plus plus. I've already uploaded them. I've got it available uh, in, say, that one in Slough, London, and uh, current package there is only London, means, you know, I can assign that to a user. Now, I don't think we're going to have time. So, sorry, we've, we've slightly uh, run short of time. Um, but it's as easy as I copy the app volumes uh, JSON and the uh, VHD uh, to these locations. And it literally takes seconds. And it comes up and tells me that it's now replicated around the world. And wherever these users log on, they will receive those uh, applications um, you know, in an instance. So, so, so sorry that we have run over and we've had some Zoom issues. Um, thank you very much. So, thanks. so I wouldn't worry too much. I mean, we've, we're in a break, right? So if we need to run over a bit more, if you've got more stuff that you want to show, I think, um, I think we're fine with that, unless anybody has a problem. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So if you've got some, the other thing I would say is just just before you finish, if you just make sure you transfer the host back to the Lund VMUG account, because otherwise we're going to get a bit stuck if you get disconnected. Yeah, sure. No problem. Cool. I, I will do that for you. So I, I think one of the uh, last things I, I quickly wanted to show is the actual application layer. Um, the, the applications are, again, you know, if we look at each capacity for each farm, each farm that you click on has this uh, file share. So in Azure, you literally look up staging uh, and in the staging, it will show you the app volumes and you copy that to any other staging for any other pod. And that is how simple the entire replication works for all your applications. Once that's done, you will then see the location here will update itself by saying you've copied it to Sly and London. So it's now available in two zones. Um, and then obviously we can go then into that. And we can update that. So we can we can add more packages. I can add the next marker. I can set this as a tested only application. And then the markers is obviously what we're going to give out, right? So if that is the current marker, it, it's got a zero, then everybody will receive current. So again, my automation comes in play. If I say a user gets an application that's marked current, um, you know, this is always the version of uh, GIMP that they, they're going to have, right? Which is 2.10.18 on this version. Um, if I have a different version, I can assign that to say maybe a developer or some somebody else, a DevOps, uh, that maybe want to test with two or three different versions. But for my general community, they will get the marker called uh, current. So that's very simple to do then, right? Um, but also the same in the same way that we can do app volumes as easily in the cloud as we could on-prem, um, the same goes for remote applications. Remote applications is again, you know, we scan from the farms that we have already. So we go and see what we have in, say, Paris. Turn me down, and you know, from here, you know, you pick up the application, and you say, you know, okay, you know, it's WordPad or whatever the case might be. Um, you know, I've got some other tools. We can do one. We can do many of them, etc. But the quickest thing that you you'd start noticing at this point is that you can only assign for instance, a, an application, if I go slightly back, from a pod, right? And this is where your design decisions come in, in play. So although it's very cost effective to use that Windows 10 multi-user session, you must remember when you harvest an application directly out of that pod, you know, you can only assign that to a user in that pod. So what that will mean for you is that 
you will need to assign, say, access to each farm in each location, unlike app volumes. App volumes, your strategy would have been that I, I start with a golden image, I start with a consistent image where I assign the same image to anybody around the world, and then I inject the app volumes on top of that, that would follow them regardless of where they connect from. Your strategy when you harvest a, a, an application like we did on our RDSH or a session host previously would be to create an entry for each of these. And you'd have to assign each of these. So that means your user would then see they have an entitlement for the Paris one and for the London one. They, they're actually going to see both at the same time. So not that you want to do that, but the reason why I'm mentioning that to you is because the first model will allow you to create a business continuity and DR strategy with hybrid for a single application across any platform. Uh, your second strategy is there, but you might want to hide that or not actively assign it. And when you do get in a bit of hot water, you'll most really have to come and quickly jump in here and then go and switch people over who uh, say previously in Paris, now to London. And again, you know, that can be easily done because all of this, uh, you know, the, the aggregation for your authentication uh, and access itself is done through Workspace ONE. So Workspace ONE access is a full entitlement for you when you use this platform. And that is also underpinning any broker status that you have. So the broker that brings all of that cloud platforms together for you, which has a single unique URL you now have to worry about, will connect to all your UAGs, regardless of where they are, and that will be fronted by access. Access will then become your aggregator. Uh, half your applications might be 2FA, MFA from Microsoft uh, Azure uh, and, and you know, AAD, uh, but you might also have access for some of these applications into say Google or to AWS or Okta or, or PingFed or different uh, 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 you know, sort of connection points for each one of those applications. Now, the only thing that, that must be pointed out is when you start moving about in your catalog and you set this up and it all looks great, um, you know, you're going to see these, these resources come through that you have just assigned um, to your tenant. The one thing, however, that you will not see when you work through this is uh, we used to see this as virtual apps, right? Um, and the virtual apps now won't show you anything. Uh, it only shows two desktops, and these two desktops is from on-prem. So my virtual app collection uh, connector, as you can see, is a physical connector to on-prem. Now, you don't have to worry about this. And the reason for this is the cloud, this uses skim. So there's a full skim integration. So whatever you go and assign uh, to your user here, once you've integrated access, this will automatically through skim publish directly to your user, his or her entitlement into this dashboard. And that's it from me, guys. I hope you enjoyed that session. I'm sorry it was so crowded. I, I will I will try and do my best uh, next time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no worries. Thanks, man. No, it was interesting. It's always good to um, have a live no safety net demo. And I think we've got another one uh, a bit later, if I remember rightly, from uh, Dean and Michael.